Welcome to Cincy Reformed. I'm Pastor Brandon. Join with Pastor Zach. We're pastors at Westside Reformed Church, a URC congregation in Cincinnati, Ohio. And today we wanted to talk about justification, uh, the Protestant justification uh, by faith. And we wanted to talk about maybe the steps of it, the logic of it, the, the progression of it, you know, how it fleshes itself out and makes sense. And we want to kind of walk through some of the, the, the big pillars of, of that doctrine. And that the, one of the very first pillars is just the fact that we will all give an account to God one day. Um, you know, we are all on a, you could say, a conveyor belt that's leading us to the very courtroom of God. And nobody can, can escape it. Nobody can get off the ride. Everybody's on that ride and will one day stand before, before God. We, we see this in Scripture at several places. Uh, for example, Romans 14, 12. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And finally, in Hebrews 4.13, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to his eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So over and over and over again, the biblical writers realize we are going to stand before God. Um, he is holy. We're going to stand before him, and we're going to give an account of ourselves and, and, and our lives and uh, what has been done. We're going to give an account to God, and that's a basic pillar of, of justification in terms of thinking through the process and, and, and the impact and what it means. Uh, Zach, what, what's another maybe key element here? Yeah, so when we begin to think about God as creator and that God is in himself perfectly just and righteous, and we would actually want that to be no other way, mm -hmm. we would not want a God who is unjust. We would not want a God who mm -hmm. is unrighteous and unfair and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so when we begin to think about that, though, that becomes a real problem for us because then we begin to think about how God then being perfectly righteous in himself, he is not going to allow anyone to dwell with him who has unrighteousness in them. And that becomes a problem because we are unrighteous. And we have not because of our fall in Adam and in our actual sins within ourselves, with so both original and actual sins, we have broken the law of God. And breaking the law of God, we are then no longer entitled to have communion with him face-to-face uh, -face, directly. That is, uh, it is a fellowship of blessing that is cut off. And so when we think about James 2 verse 10, where we read that whoever keeps the whole law, this is hypothetically, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Why? Because God gave all of it. And to fail in one point means you've disobeyed God himself. You've become unrighteous, in other words. Daniel Doriani had a great image on, mm -hmm. on James 2.10. He said, he said that the law is almost like a sheet of glass, and one rock just, just shatters the whole glass. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing that, and that, I think it's a very helpful image to think about this. Um, you could also think about how in Romans chapter 3, uh, Paul describes the human condition. He begins in Romans 1 by talking about Gentiles. He goes into Romans chapter 2 talking about Jews. And then he gets here in Romans chapter 3 saying, None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless, it's talking about a moral worthlessness. No one does good, not even one. And so when we begin to think about this, um, the, the, the reality that God is our righteous creator who demands righteousness and we will give an account to him and that we, as we come before that time of, uh, of his reckoning, and we come before him as those who are in ourselves unrighteous, we're in trouble. Because standing before God as a lawbreaker means that we will face condemnation. And as Paul goes on in Romans 3, that the whole world, all of our mouth, every mouth will be stopped as the whole world is called to account for being a sinner and lawbreaker before Almighty God. And so this then creates the plight for us. 
in terms of our need for righteousness to pass through the judgment and not be condemned. And so then the question of justification becomes, how then is that problem answered? So Brandon, maybe you could help us with that. Right. So um, all of us will stand before God. Only the righteous will, will survive. Only the righteous will not be condemned to uh, an eternity in hell. And we are not righteous. As Paul said, nobody is righteous. Um, and so we need someone else's righteousness. Right? We need uh, what uh, some people call an alien righteousness, a foreign righteousness. We need someone else to give us their righteousness, and that is Christ. Because Christ uh, lived a, a perfect life. Um, Christ fulfilled the law. Christ um, gave himself as the perfect sacrifice. So we see this in various places in Scripture. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Um, Romans 5, 19. For, um, for as by one man's disobedience, talking about Adam, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, talking about Christ, the second Adam, the many will be made righteous. So in Christ, we can be made righteous in Christ. Um, and Christ can give us his, his righteousness, almost like, like a robe or something. Um, Isaiah uses this imagery in Isaiah 61.10, where he says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. He's talking about being clothed and with this robe of righteousness. And it's a great image there, I think, of, of that righteousness that we need from Jesus Christ. But maybe, Zach, you can talk about how do we get it? Mm -hmm. You know, if Christ has this, you know, quote-unquote robe mm -hmm. to impart to, to, to people, do we get it by being good, by doing stuff? What is it? Yeah, like if somebody wanted to uh, suggest that we can somehow obtain that robe of righteousness by doing a bunch of good stuff, then that would be really contradictory to the whole idea in the first place of giving us a robe to cover our bad works. Right. I mean, that does, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, yet that's how many people try to, to argue for it. Well, clean yourself up and do enough good, and then, then Jesus will give you righteousness. The problem here, as Isaiah 64 makes very clear, all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags before God. In the state of sin, even our best works are not up to snuff, because there's something in us, in our motives in our goals, in our faith, something within us is always falling short of the glory of God. And so for us to somehow achieve that from something within ourselves, that's completely contrary to the whole idea of righteousness as a gift of grace. And so how then do we receive it? Well, we receive it by faith. We receive it by faith. As uh, we read in Galatians 5, 4, you who would be justified by the law you have fallen away from grace. So there's no justification that occurs by law-keeping. And remember, the law here is commands of love. Love God, love your neighbor. That's how Jesus summarizes the law for us. Love God, love your neighbor. You cannot love God, love your neighbor in order to be justified. That is impossible to do. So instead what we do is we believe in Jesus Christ, who is himself our righteousness. As Paul writes um, in Romans 5, we have been justified by faith. And since that is true, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He does not say we're justified by faith and works or faith and love. We have been justified by faith. And this is a justification in the past. We have been justified. That is a complete thing. There's no increase to our justification. It has been done, and now the effect of that justification is ongoing, and it is permanent because it is based not upon ourselves and our own deeds. If it were based upon our own deeds, then you could increase it or decrease it. You could forfeit it, those kinds of things. But since it is not, 
because it's based upon the complete, the finished work of Jesus Christ, then our justification is sure and secure. As I was preached in Acts 13, Therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Again, what does the law of Moses teach? Love God, love your neighbor. You can't be justified by that. You cannot do so. So you must believe in Jesus Christ. One final place that we could turn here is Galatians 2, verse 16, where Paul writes to the Galatians who are trying to top up their justification by their works. They're trying to make sure they're really justified by their commitment to the law of Moses. He says, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. I don't know how many other ways he could have said it in that one verse. But over and over he repeats, just to make sure you get the picture, that we receive righteousness as a gift to us when we trust in Jesus Christ. Not when we perform, not when we bring to God our spiritual resume, but when we say, hey, I want the resume of Jesus Christ, and I rest and trust in him alone. But Brandon, does that make faith a work? Does that, is, that, is this God lowering the bar and say, hey, you know, I'm not going to take all those works. I just want one work from you. So I'm going to lower the bar. I'm going to grade on a curve here. Is that how we're speaking about faith? No. We, maybe we should read Galatians 2.16 again. It's, it's, not a, it's not a work, right? And we can't, and, and people want to uh, want to make faith a work or a baptism a work or a sacrament or something where, you know, we're going to, Earn and it's almost like a, a secret way to kind of sneak in a work of a faith or of a sacrament or of some sort of system of confession and penance or some, some weird thing. But again, that warning I think that that you read from Galatians five four is apt. You are severed from Christ if you are trying to be justified by the works of the law. That's not a small thing. That's not a small matter. That's massive. Mm -hmm. I, you don't want to be severed from Christ. Um, and so it is, it is by faith, but you know, as you mentioned, when you say justification by faith alone, then people start wondering, well, is, is, is my faith like the grounds by which I'm justified? I think the Belgian Confession really helps us to um, nuance what we're saying here when we say justification by faith alone. The Belgian Confession, Article 22, puts it like this. And therefore, we justly say with Paul that we are justified by faith alone, or by faith apart from works. However, we do not mean, properly speaking, that it is faith itself that justifies us. For faith is only the instrument by which we embrace Christ, our righteousness. But Jesus Christ is our righteousness, crediting to us all his merits, and all the holy works he has done for us in our place. The faith, in, uh, the faith is the instrument that keeps us in communion with him and with all of his benefits. When those benefits are made ours, they are more than enough to absolve us all our sins. In other words, the basis is the merits of Christ, the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. All that Christ has done, imputed to us. And I think that this is a great um, time to mention as well, that justification is not God just wiping away your slate clean and saying, well, now you're a clean slate. Now you're neutral. Uh, no, justification is Christ imputing a righteousness to you, um, all of his merits, so that when God looks at you, he looks at you as though you have kept his law flawlessly, that you kept his commands from cradle to grave in thought, word, and deed. You have given personal, perfect, exact, entire obedience to his law without any flaws, any defects, any sin. Because Christ, your substitute, has imputed his righteousness to you. 
And so in justification, it's not a look to myself and my faith. It's a look to Christ and his righteousness and his merits and his work on our behalf that he performed for us. That's the Protestant view, the biblical view of justification by faith. Anything else to add? It's counterintuitive, isn't it? I think that's why people want to smuggle in their works. Because we think that we should have to do something. We should have to merit something. It should be based upon us that we get into heaven and others don't. It should be something that we do. But it's counterintuitive, and that's why it's actually really good news. Because if it were left up to us, even in the slightest form, we would forfeit it. We would not match up to what is required of us. And so when we think about the good news of Jesus Christ, at the very foundation of that good news is Christ for us and Christ's righteousness imputed to us whereby we can be forgiven of our sins. We can hear the verdict. They're not only, like you said, are we neutral, but we're righteous. And we can be secure then to build a life of Christian piety upon that glorious and great foundation. And I love how Paul, you know, when he's writing Romans, you know, he's speaking very um, uh, forensically, for example, in chapter 5. And then as he's, and he transitions into more of a sanctif- sanctification and growing in holiness in the subsequent chapters. But I love the question he asks. He, he, he anticipates an objection where somebody might look at this and say, well, it's too easy. And then they might look at that and say, well, I can just keep on sinning. That grace may abound. And then what does Paul say? By no means. Like the justified person who's justified by faith alone, not by works, is not somebody who just lives in wickedness and filth and and, and is dead, but somebody who is alive, who is thankful and has gratitude towards God, and who does who does works that flow from um, that salvation, not something that merits the salvation. And that's part of the, the debate, too, between various ideas of works and, and grace, where we all understand that um, we were made, as um, Ephesians 2.10, for good works, mm-hmm. but some people want to make the good work somehow the foundation or the root where Jesus, the apostles, are very careful to say no Good works are the fruit, the outcome, the consequence, never the root, never the foundation. So I think that's, that's a helpful clarification to, to, to make. Because even, even in Scripture, the Apostle Paul anticipates objections that people are, are probably going to raise here. That's right. And we hope this has been helpful for you. Hope that uh, it's been comforting for you as well to be thinking about Christ our righteousness, not ourselves as offering up merit to God so we are the Cincy Reform Podcast. We thank you for joining us this week. Hope you join us next week. Find our, find our other episodes at cincyreform.org. Check out our church at westsidereformed.org. Bye-bye.